Only about 5% of the universe is made up of stuff that we're familiar with. Protons, neutrons, electrons, quarks, and all the other matter that make up our bodies, the planets, the stars, everything we've ever seen, is only a tiny fraction of what makes up our entire universe. 85% of the universe's mass is made up of something called dark matter, and we don't even know what it is. So why is it called dark matter? So it's called matter because it gravitates in the same way you and I do. And it's called dark because we've not seen it very well. This is Patty Fox, theoretical physicist at Fermilab, which is home to the world's second largest particle accelerator and where lots of cool science stuff happens. But basically it doesn't reflect light and it doesn't emit light, but it also doesn't interact in any other way as far as we can tell very, very strongly. So it, so it interacts very, 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 very weakly. That basically means it can fly through stuff with impunity. And that's why it's so hard to measure. But we know it's out there. How do you, how do you know that? Ah, that's a good question. So we know that from the way it interacts gravitationally. So everything, all matter, basically all matter pulls stuff towards it. You know, you and I are being pulled towards each other right now, very, very weakly by gravity. Mm -hmm. And although we don't know what makes up dark matter, we know how it interacts in terms of gravity. And uh, we've seen it, its effects gravitationally on the cosmos at large. Invisible matter was first postulated in 1932 by Jan Oort, but it wasn't until a year later that Fritz Zwicky, while measuring the gravitational mass of the Coma Cluster of Galaxies, noticed something odd. By measuring the velocity of the orbiting galaxies, Zwicky was able to calculate the mass of the cluster. However, the mass he calculated was far greater than the observable stars in the galaxies. His results seemed to suggest that there is more matter out there than could be seen. He called this Dunkel Materie, or Dunkle Materie, or something, it, which translates to dark matter. However, for the time being, his results were largely ignored. In the 60s and 70s, scientist Vera Rubin noticed a difference between the angular motion of the galaxies she predicted and the motion she observed. This was a huge problem. Basically, Rubin found that galaxies were spinning too fast. So fast, in fact, that they should be flinging all of their stars out into outer space. But they weren't. Obviously. This came to be known as the galaxy rotation problem. To solve this problem, Rubin calculated that there had to be a bunch of matter that they couldn't see, keeping the stars gravitationally bound to their galaxies. As much as 10 times as much matter. While at first met with skepticism, her work was eventually verified, and it became the strongest evidence we had for the existence of dark matter. And since then, we've seen more and more evidence of dark matter. Although we've never directly seen dark matter itself, we can infer its presence by how it affects regular matter. And its effects are pretty noticeable. We can see it in the way it affects the microwave background radiation left over from the Big Bang, and how it has shaped the large-scale structure of the universe itself. Galaxies wouldn't even exist if it weren't for the extra pull of dark matter. So we've inferred the existence of dark matter indirectly from those effects, but we've never really got our hands on the stuff in the lab in a very direct way yet. Mm -hmm. If we believe this dark matter stuff is basically everywhere, it sort of pervades uh, the, the galaxy we live in, mm -hmm. that in fact our galaxy is, is, is sits inside a cloud of this dark matter stuff, and so we'd like to see whether this, the, if they are particles, whether they come in and interact with anything in the lab. The problem, though, with detecting dark matter is that it's pretty much undetectable. The hypothetical particles that make up dark matter are called WIMPs. WIMPs stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particles, and since they only weakly interact with ordinary matter, we have a hard time knowing that they are there. They go straight through anything, including our detectors. Regular matter, on the other hand, the matter we're made up of, does a fantastic job of interacting with itself. Isn't that right, Craig? Oh, huh? hey, yeah. hey, oh, hey, <laughs> Yeah, just having a little fun together. Interacting matter. I mean, I can't put my hand through this wall because I interact too strongly. It's good to know that you're not dark matter. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. But Since ordinary matter interacts with itself so much, it can act as noise, triggering sensitive detectors, mucking up results, and basically drowning out any dark matter particles that might be coming through. So you have to stop all the ordinary stuff from interacting with your experiment, and that includes high energy particles like cosmic rays that are raining down on Earth all the time. And the best way to do this is to put as much Earth between your experiment and all the cosmic rays raining down on the planet. In other words, put your experiment as far underground as possible. A little shaky? I'm not, I'm not claustrophobic or anything though, so I'm, I'm okay. You guys, anybody here claustrophobic? Uh oh. <laughs> How do you feel, man? I try to pretend I don't know where I am. So what is this? So this is the DM ice experiment. This is a dark matter experiment. What they've done is they put a sodium iodide crystal uh, inside this lead coffin, and it's poisonous. Uh, lead is poisonous. Yeah, that's yeah, true. That's a good point. <laughs> it's like they just have a little extra room under the stairway and they're like... Uh, uh, let's let's experiment with dark we, matter. We put experiments wherever we can. The real experiment is at the South Pole uh, where they have put it uh, in with the ice cube experiment about two miles under the ice there. 
The ice cube he's talking about is not the star of Triple X State of the Union, or are we there yet? It's the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, which is a gigantic telescope designed to detect neutrinos, which are made of ordinary matter, but like dark matter, are notoriously hard to capture. And instead of being buried underground, the Ice Cube's neutrino detector is buried under two kilometers of ice just like Ice Cube. The Ice Cube hopes to get indirect evidence of dark matter through the detection of excess neutrinos. Theoretically, since dark matter particles have mass, they should be gravitationally attracted to the sun. Enough dark matter particles should be trapped by the sun and collect in its core to annihilate with each other, giving off neutrinos. The Ice Cube should be able to infer this dark matter's existence by detecting occasional unexplained neutrino collisions and tracing them back to the source. There are also experiments measuring the release of gamma rays at the center of the galaxy and looking for any excess that might suggest the presence of dark matter. But they've never directly detected at a dark matter particle. The cryogenic dark matter search, which is located deep in a mine in northern Minnesota, has picked up several interesting signals since 2007 that might be evidence of dark matter, but it could be nothing at all. Now these are always, these could go either way. I mean, it could be the tip of an iceberg, or it could just be uh, the background you know, just a fluke, an accident. So it's hard to detect dark matter because it hardly ever interacts with regular matter. But another problem is that we don't know exactly where all the dark matter is. And if you want to have the best chance of finding dark matter, it's best to point your detector where all the dark matter is hiding. I'm very good at hide and seek. I know these things. Mm-hmm. So we're pretty sure our galaxy sits in a spherical halo of dark matter. Most of the dark matter is in this halo, and a surprisingly little amount of dark matter inhabits the disk where we live. So looking for dark matter within our vicinity might be very difficult. But we'd expect an increase in dark matter toward the core of the galaxy since the density of matter increases. Of course, just because we know where dark matter might be doesn't mean we have any more of a clue of what it actually is. The main theory is that dark matter is a new particle, one that's not currently part of our standard model, but there are other theories as well. It's been theorized that dark matter isn't a particle at all, but that gravity might not work like we think it does. On large scales, like the scale of galaxies in the universe at large, gravity might display different properties, and the excess mass we see all over the universe might just be a side effect of this modified gravity. But once you start messing with gravity, you start messing with relativity, and everybody knows that Einstein doesn't go away without a fight. So maybe it would be better if dark matter wasn't some new, unheard of kind of matter, but regular matter, just in an exotic form like a primordial black hole, or something even more undetectable than a neutrino. But that seems unlikely. If it was ordinary matter and as common as it seems to be, it would start clumping up into visible objects like stars and galaxies. Or maybe it's some kind of superfluid, which goes through different phases, which makes it hard to detect and gives it unexpected behaviors. But the new particle theory is definitely the most widely accepted and the strongest candidate for dark matter's secret identity. And if it's one thing for sure, whatever dark matter's secret identity is, its discovery will revolutionize physics as we know it. And by revolutionize, we mean really screw up how we thought the universe works. <laughs> uh -huh. We have no idea what's going on. Yeah, totally clueless. It seems like if there is another particle that makes up dark matter, it kind of screws up this nice, neat standard model that you yeah. have. Is that like, how do you feel about that? Or like, it would be awesome. Yeah, it would be, It'd awesome. be awesome. Yeah, the, the one thing every theorist and I believe every experimentalist uh, craves for and hopes for on a daily basis is something comes along and screws up the standard model. Mm -hmm. The standard model is a wonderful theory that explains everything we've seen so far about subatomic physics or subnuclear physics. But we don't think it's the final story. We don't think it's the final answer for the way nature works. So we believe there's more out there. So to see some phenomena that doesn't, um, doesn't, it isn't explained by the standard model would be fantastic. And it could well be, I mean, there's, there's five times as much uh, dark matter as there is regular matter, right? So, so it's unlikely that the, the dark sector, as we like to call it, is simply just one new particle. There's probably a whole lot of new phenomena in there that we just aren't privy to yet because it's hard for us to measure it, but we need to find ways that will allow us to measure it, and it will be a whole new realm of uh, physics for us to investigate. So what do you think dark matter is? Is it a new particle, or is it gravity behaving weirdly? Or maybe it's a wholly unknown form of physics that we're only beginning to understand, and most importantly, will we ever be able to harness it as fuel for an interstellar delivery spaceship? It's dark matter! So this guy just unloaded a steaming pile of starship fuel? Let us know in the comments. I wanted to say that. Let us know in the comments. Go ahead, there you go. I want to let you know about another series here on the internet that everyone on this show has worked on. It's called Platoon, Platoon of Power Squadron. That's right. It's about superheroes. Well, no, they're not superheroes. superheroes. No. They're normal people with superpowers. That's right. And there's a star of that show who's awesome. Yeah, yeah Jake Jarvie. You know, Craig Benzie and me. I still, oh. I'm in it as well. Oh, you're in that show? I am. W what part do you play? Are you, was it just like an extra or something? extra good. If you've never heard of it, I'm going to put a link right up here on Matt's head that gives a great description of the first nine episodes. And there's an Indiegogo fundraiser linked in the doobly-doo for the 10th episode. After six years, the final episode is being made. You guys should check it out. It has nothing to do with this show, but we're all really proud of it, and, it, and we think you'll like it. Okay, last week we talked about Henry Darger, and you guys had a lot of things to say. 
All right, and we got a lot of things to say as well. We do. Bert Paulson, among others, pointed out that we didn't mention that some of the girls that Darger drew had penises. This wasn't an oversight, and we did have some discussions about whether we should mention it or not, but it seemed too distracting from the bigger picture, and in the end, there's no explanation for it. There's a lot of theories, though. Some have mentioned that the penises represent Darger's issues with gender. He might have been gay or experienced gender dysmorphia, or maybe he didn't understand the difference between girls or boys, or that the penises on the Vivian girls represented masculinity and power. Whatever the reason, Darger isn't around to explain it to us, so we will never know. A few of you thought Darger's depictions of naked and tortured children represented a fetish or maybe latent pedophilia, and that's why he didn't want anybody to see his art. Well, we'll never know for sure what it all meant to Darger, but there doesn't seem to be much evidence that he was a pedophile. He didn't sexualize the children, and all the stories are from the point of view of the Vivian girls and the children, so it seems like we're supposed to sympathize with them and not the evil men that are torturing them. There's much more evidence that Darger had a troubled childhood himself, and the violence and the torture we see in his art is probably a way of him processing and dealing with his own child abuse. And there's always the possibility that it means nothing at all. He did it for no reason, but we'll never know for sure. I would also argue that there's a lot weirder and more disturbing art out there right now, but we don't accuse the artists of being deranged because they're still around to explain it. The fact that we don't know much about Darger makes him kind of a blank canvas, and we can make him whatever kind of person we want. It's really up to you. A lot of you had some great answers for what art is. High Waisted Pantaloons says, The Art Assignment, a fellow PBS digital show, taught me that art has no single definition. Art is everything. Art is anything that makes you feel. For Datum said something similar. He basically said anything that evokes an emotional reaction could be considered art. Sure. Lynn Skysong said that art doesn't need an audience. Art just is. I like that one. I like the way you think. Thanks for all your wonderful comments. Next week is our final episode in the Secrets playlist. It's all about hackers. Good hackers. Yeah, good hackers. Like Angelina Jolie and uh, the other person. In Hackers? Yeah. <laughs> would, you, would they be technically considered good hackers? Yeah, they're the, they're the good guys, right, in the, in the movie? Yeah, I've never seen but that but they movie. do break the law. <laughs>